Hello. Wah. Wah, wah, wah. Wah, 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 wah. Happy Friday, guys. We haven't had a, a guest on our channel in so, 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 so long. And she can currently hear us. She just, she's not on screen yet. But before we get started, um, I do want to let you guys know that you are more than welcome to ask any questions that you can. In fact, we don't really have a whole lot of topic today. What we want to do is use this as an opportunity for you guys to get in as many questions as possible, because we know that this is like a rare occurrence, being able to ask a professional product photography coach anything that you want. And and one of the things that she and I were just talking about before we started the stream was that you don't need expensive, ridiculous cameras. So if you are running your business right now from your smartphone, if, if you have a nice camera, that's cool. But don't think that money is an obstacle here. If you have questions about how to, you know, use your phone, or if you have questions about cameras, that's fine. But don't assume that, you know, that you can't do this if you currently have a really basic setup, because thankfully that is exactly what Christina specializes in. Um, and, and a couple quick things uh, before we bring her on. Down below in the video description, there are two links. Well, there's more than two links, but there are two links that you're going to want to look at. First one is to her channel. If you guys want amazing free advice, be sure to go and click on that link and subscribe to her channel because she has a ton of valuable content that's going to help you guys binge it this weekend, okay? Second thing is that on Sunday, she will be closing registration for her five-day natural light photography challenge. There's a link to that down below. Um, that is an amazing, very, very affordable. It's a $37 five-day challenge. You can re-watch the video. So if you can't attend live, that's fine. It's kicking off Monday though. So please, if this is something that you feel like you need help with, make sure that you check that out. That is such an affordable and awesome program. I'm going to be taking it as well because I am not great with natural light. I, I'm good with editing them afterwards, but I would really like to learn how to take photos that I don't have to spend, you know, 20 minutes editing per picture just to have good photos. So without further ado, do you want to go ahead and bring... Let's see if the new fade-in transition works. <gasps> it did! Oh, the Friday Bean logo disappeared when we brought her on. Oh, I, I can... Well, Wait. I guess it doesn't matter. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. If you break it, then Shh. it'll mess up. Yeah. Don't break it. No breaking it. Hello, Christina! Yay! This is going to be fun. How many people do we have live so far? Let's let's. We are at one forty-five according to YouTube, but it's usually a little slow. Oh, okay. So, um, lots of you here. Hopefully, we get lots of good questions. But you know, let's go ahead and start at the bottom while we kind of coax them into you know being brave and go. asking some good questions. Good Friday, um, Christina. One okay. of the biggest issues that I see, you know, with with new Etsy sellers is. Bad photos. I mean, I see pictures of, you know, they'll lay out a, a towel and they'll take a picture of their jewelry on this textured towel or, you know, their photos, they'll, it'll be a beautiful product, but the photos will just be so bleak and there won't be a lot of, you know, color and they, they look dull and gross. Or I always have sellers who say, oh, every time I take photos outside to try to get natural light, my photos are all blue. They look blue. And I, I suffer from that. Um, base level, like newbie of the newbiest tips. If you were talking to a brand new seller and you could give them like three ultimate tips to start with, I know I'm putting you on the spot right now. Um, what would those three like base tips that you would want creators to know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, one one second. For some reason, they're saying that your sound is not coming through, but it appears oh. that it is coming through just fine. So give me one moment. Uh, mic check, mic check. <clears throat> here, one, one said low sound. <laughs> Her audio is coming through perfectly fine here, so I'm not entirely sure. Give us one why that would be second. The case. Well, we appreciate you guys for letting us know. Monitor and output. 
All right, maybe go ahead and give us a couple test, test, tests, and then we'll wait like 30 seconds to see if the audience was here. <laughs> was that what they saw? <laughs> yeah, I think yeah. so. All right, can you hear her now, guys? Can you guys hear me now? It's it's like the old, um, oh yeah, God, yeah. what was, what, what was- The Verizon. What, was it Verizon? Can you hear what me now? It? Good, Sprint. Now? Sprint? Sprint? <laughs> Sprint. Low sound, okay. Low sound, hmm. Her sound is actually on. No sound. Look, we can hear. Okay, her yeah. Okay, there we go. Yay. Yeah. For some reason, it had you set to monitor only. I've oh, never no. used Collab Cam before, so there's no reason that should have been. Okay, so I guess let's. Uh, Christina, can you redo, redo, redo the tip? Redo. Reverse. <laughs> okay. Speed round. Okay. It shows us in our mixer that she was coming through fine. It's really weird. It was in the back end. That's fine. Anyway. Okay. You gotta right. love live, right? Yeah, right. Uh, remember, I told issue. you yesterday that there would be an attack issue. It never fails. There's always at least one, but hopefully, you know, knock on wood. It's our first time, guys. Take it easy. Yeah. All right. Let's. Okay. So if you're just starting out as a seller, three tips to get you started. You need to understand how important product photography is going to be to growing your sales, to making sales on Etsy, specifically on your website, even on social, to attracting new customers. Uh, second is going to be this little smartphone right here is the perfect camera for you. And third is going to be understanding how to utilize light because light is going to be the most important element when it comes to taking quality product photos. Awesome. And, and, and I'm assuming I'm right mm -hmm. to say that not all light is equal because there's also, you know, I've, I've had sellers who are like the light in my bathroom is so pretty and so bright. But when I take my pictures... They just don't, they don't look the same as they do in person. Okay. Yeah. So let me rephrase <laughs> that. we we'll bring it down. to. I would talk about bringing it down to like a third grade level, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> a lot of makers want to turn their overhead lights on and they put their product on a table and they want to shoot. <laughs> so two things, we need to learn how to maximize natural light and utilize natural light, or we need to have a proper artificial light set up. Your kitchen lights, your the lights on your ceiling fan, your bathroom lights, those are not lights that you want to use to shoot product photos. No. Yeah, yeah. And and I, I mean, I always look at like, oh, the perfect selfie light. And I'll walk around the house with my camera looking for my perfect mm -hmm. selfie light and, and in front of a window, even for pictures yep. of, of my face. That's where you got to be is right in front of the window to get the perfect mm -hmm. selfie light. Um, so yeah, with, so selfie, that's a good one. Selfie, <laughs> you want that front light, right? We're going to like <laughs> want that flat light to fill in all those, you know, uh, wrinkles, pores, whatever. And then with product, we're going to take that setup and same concept. You want to get right next to the window, but you want to shoot from the side. Side light is going to be perfect for product photography. Awesome. So um, let's see. Evil Squirrel had asked, what would be the recommendation when taking pictures of high shine objects like jewelry and glassware? Um, that's a question that I hear a lot. Yes. So we're going to cover this real big on day four of the challenge. But when it comes to highly reflective products, you are going to want diffusion is going to be your best friend. So essentially, you're either going to want to use reflection. So reflected type light, it's an indirect kind of light. So direct light, you will see the presence of light falling. It's so hard doing these lives because I, I visuals are so easy to <laughs> I want to show <laughs> visuals. I want to I want to be able to point to the picture. Right. Um, but if you have direct sunlight, it's going to hit your product. And you're going to see this appearance of brightness in some portions, shadows in the other. It's going to be high contrast there. And what that does is it creates hot spots on reflective products or potentially causes you to be reflected back into it. Um, other objects around your in your setup to be reflected back into it. So when you're shooting highly reflective products, you want to create indirect light, meaning we're either going to do some type of diffusion, um, which means we're going to kind of block the light. A diffuser is a transparent material. Actually, I've got one right here. I can show you. She's come with examples. It came with so these, these I can visually show. Examples. But this is a diffuser. So you can see my hand through this diffuser, right? So this allows the light to come through. And what happens is not only does the light scatter, making the appearance of the light larger, but it reduces the intensity. So this is one way that you can kind of prevent reflections. Um, another is to change the product angle, to change the camera angle. 
Um, you can use reflective type light. So reflective light is another option um, that's considered to be indirect. Yeah. So the that, diffuser. Can I mention quick? Yeah, yeah. A lot of times, you know, um, Mark will say on the Friday Bean to be super like specific with your questions. That's helpful if you guys can kind of do the same thing. It'll just help me actually get you a better answer if you can be very specific in your in your questions. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's so hard to how do I make photos look good? Like there's really no way. To... <laughs> exactly. <so. laughs> um, but but what you're saying about the diffusing, like guys, think about when you have, for example, like a porch light or any light bulb that's exposed, not in a lampshade. Mm -hmm. You know, you're going to want a frosted bulb, right? You're not going to want a, a clear bulb because it's it's going to be right in your face. It's kind of the same way just like with our studio lights we've got big giant white umbrellas mm -hmm. over those that way we're not sitting here uh mm -hmm. you know um and and we had another kind of similar question uh rachel price had asked i'm currently struggling with taking pictures of small glittery items such as earrings mm -hmm. it's hard to catch the sparkle along with the colors um yeah. and i'm assuming that the advice there is going to be very similar okay so first thing i want to say there is a lot of times we think that we have to show the entire product and all of its amazingness in every single image we take. So when it comes to taking product photos, product photography is essentially it's nonverbal communication. Okay. So one of the most important things, especially when we can actually get somebody into our listing is we want to be able to communicate the most important information, the most important features of our products and our services to the customer. So each image should be intentionally created to serve a specific purpose. So maybe your first photo is a studio shot on white and it's going to show them exactly what they're going to receive when they purchase that product. So the studio shot on white, which I'm sure people are going to have lots of questions about, but the <laughs> studio shot on white actually shows the product truest to real life as possible because there's no conflicting um, color cast or anything like that from using additional props, backdrops, anything like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then what kind of product? She said glitter products. Yeah, glittery. Did she say what kind of product that they were just jewelry? Glittering? I think jewelry. Okay. So maybe think like uh, Swarovski like, crystals, or and... or even things like earrings with like the dangling metal circles that hang yeah. off of them. Those kind of things where okay. there might be multiple different angles of of things shining. So maybe your <laughs> second image is to show how big your product is. So you're going to do scale. You're going to show size. And then if you have a product that has very specific detail like that, especially glitter or anything sparkly, the key to actually capturing that sparkle is to actually manipulate the light a little bit. So sometimes you can get like just a little flashlight. You do have to be careful because small light sources, that's what creates hard to find shadows. So when your light source is smaller than your product or you take a large light source and you move it really far away from your product, that's where you get hard to find shadows. So you can take a light. Sometimes I use like an LED, like a little LED strip, and you can just kind of like move it around or move the product around to capture that sparkle. But this is also where video is going to come huge into play, creating a listing video to show these features that you may not be able to capture in images. But the biggest point that I want to make here is that each image should kind of serve a specific answer a specific question, show a specific feature, maybe tackle objections people would have to buying or using your product, but you wanna be intentional with each image. So you're gonna to wanna to at least have one image that shows the detail and shows that sparkle, but you don't necessarily have to capture it in every single photo. And I think that holds a lot of makers up sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, one thing that I used to do um, <clears throat> when I would take photos of my jewelry, when I use Swarovski crystals, is I got one of those big poster boards, the ones that are like thick with the foam. Yep. And I would hold that sucker up and I would move it up and move it down and move it over here. And I would take pictures every single step of the way until, you know, when I brought it back to my my computer, I could go through them all and find the one that caught that mm -hmm. perfect little bit of sparkle. Uh, but it, it was a big pain in the butt. And my neighbors thought I was crazy just outside waving the, the poster board <laughs> so all that's around. It. You, used, you used reflective light. So same yes. concept as like putting, you know, a little, you know, LED strip or something like that. You're using reflective light and you're reflecting that light back onto the product and it's capturing that detail. So yeah, that's a great, great example too. There's a lot of different solutions and that's you know, especially with light. That's why the challenge is going to be so cu uh, cool because I'm going to give you the cure, every single possibility to help you get those, those results.
Yeah, and if you guys missed it at the beginning, because I know a couple of you joined late, um, down below, uh, you have until Sunday to sign up for Christina Nicole's Natural Light Challenge. It's only $37, guys. That is a ridiculous steal. And she's going to focus on making sure mm -hmm. that you are able to diagnose all of these problems with your lighting um, and, and being able to fix them, which I'm taking it because I suck at it. I'm really, really bad. Um, so I'm really excited for that. Um, and, and speaking of listing videos, which you mentioned a second mm -hmm. ago, we had a question. This is more, I actually have an answer for this, but I'm curious just to know, okay. see what you will say. Um, she said, I do, I, I assume, maybe, maybe you're not a she. I do digital art, uh, but would like to create a short video of printing and hanging them on my wall. But my phone camera is too grainy and dark. Um, do, do you have any insight for video? So a video is pretty much going to be the, the, the same lighting scenario. So when yeah. I take video, unless you're shooting videos of yourself, <laughs> that's a different, different story. But if you're taking videos of your product, you're going to want the same type of light situation. So a lot of times if we can talk about the smartphone quick smartphone, like I said, if, especially if you have, and honestly, I shouldn't say that. I can take an old iPhone, like I have an old iPhone 5C that my kids play with, and I've used it before to show how when you have the proper light setup, you can create, you know, pretty similar results. Now, of course, the newest type of smartphone, it's going to have the best technology, all of that. We all know that, right? We also know that a DSLR camera is going to create better results as well. But the thing to think about here is a lot of times when, you know, photographers are pushing those DSLR cameras, they're used to printing photos. And that is a whole, whole different scenario. Um, you are working with digital images. You are actually reducing pixels and reducing file size so you can optimize those images for the web. So this little guy, it creates the perfect picture for you, but it does have limitations. So one of those being it doesn't function well under a low light. And honestly, Apple specifically, because I'm an iPhone expert, um, Apple has been putting a lot of focus the past couple of years into those low light conditions and yes, getting yes. better results with low light. And probably, I mean, I'm assuming most smartphone, um, you know, companies like Samsung and all that are doing the yeah. same. Um, so when it comes to you saying that you're experiencing grainy, you know, low light, it's not, it's not your camera. That's not the problem. Your mm -hmm. lighting, your lighting <laughs> is, is the problem. So we need to address that before and that's and it makes me so sad when makers decide to upgrade to like a thousand dollar or twenty five hundred dollar yeah. dslr camera because they think it's going to get them better results and while it will perform better in low light scenarios i mean the money Sometimes. the time and money you have to invest to learn it is a whole nother story like yeah 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 and also if if it's pixelation you're referring to as well make sure in your settings that you're also ensuring that you're recording at the highest quality that your camera can act if you're doing videos usually hd mm -hmm. will be 720p or 1080p uhd is usually 4k make sure you're recording at a higher format as well make sure you're not recording at something at like 240p because phones usually have options within the settings that allow you to switch between mm -hmm. but if it is grain specifically yeah it is it is usually a lighting issue and not a not a camera issue yeah yeah and, and that goes for your um you know taking images as well i forgot that was a video question but some cameras iphone does not but some cameras do allow you to adjust the the pixel dimensions to adjust the resolution so just yes. make sure you're always using the highest highest possible quality in your settings yes yeah and and you know something that has just for my tiktok videos and my instagram reels and and things like that um as somebody who occasionally will be just walking around my house taking quick videos um the CapCut app that I keep recommending Ooh, to you yeah. guys, it's free. Um, you can export in 4K. You, it, It's brightening tools are pretty good as long as you don't like crank them all the way up and completely wash your videos out. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a video that there's no way you can reshoot it, maybe it was like in the moment and you really want to incorporate it into your business mm -hmm. um, because it was something that was very special yeah. that you can't reproduce. You can always edit in post, but... Try like, not to make editing in post a habit. Yeah, because it takes so much time and it's so much easier if you can just do it right mm -hmm. to begin with or or edit in tiny increments rather mm -hmm. than try to restore something that is just yeah. really, really bad. And I'd rather take five minutes to reshoot than an hour and a half to fix. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we're getting a lot of questions and I'm not going to acknowledge all 
of them just because there's so many. Um, but we are getting a lot of questions related to, I take photos um, for this particular niche, we, I saw, you know, witchy, um, cottage core, you know, I take photos for, here's my, my industry. How do I get the vibe of my specific industry? And I do hear that question a lot when it comes to lifestyle shots and, you know, selecting the right props and understanding how to utilize those props. And I know that that's something that you, cover on your channel as well, because I just watched a video yes. where you were staging everything. Um, do you have any tips for for props and, and really incorporating a vibe? Yeah, so all this kind of comes back to the psychology, buyer psychology, right? Um, visual marketing and sales, we're looking at different, different, different opportunities here. So I think it's Russell Brunson. He talks about the scroller versus the searcher. So you have people who are just, aimlessly scrolling through through social, right? And you have to grab their attention. And then you have search. It's kind of the same concept. But if someone's going to search for something specifically, they kind of already know that they have a need or desire for this product. And the reason I want to kind of talk about this a little bit is because it's kind of that difference between you know, a lifestyle image that we may use on social, because we all know lifestyle images are going to convert over those pure pure white photos any day. But the lifestyle image, <clears throat> excuse me, the lifestyle image is great for social, it's great for search, it's great for inspiring use. And to do that, though, you have to be able to grab their attention. And Starla talks about this a lot in her branding, branding the planet, planet brand, is that what's called? Brand, brand planet. You guys can watch planet, that exactly. on um on Printify's YouTube channel, mm -hmm. if you go to their live tab, um, I did a webinar with them all in March. Uh, where you can go rewatch it. Okay, so everything she teaches in that, it applies to your visuals in general. So your product photos, your videos, all that kind of stuff. So you're going to want to choose props. You're going to want to choose backgrounds and settings that are going to actually attract a very specific customer. And what that means is you're going to want to use things that are relevant to them, that either ignite an emotion for them, that bring up a memory, that they recognize, because as they're scrolling through you know, social or even scrolling through search, they're going to ignore things that aren't relevant to them. And this is one of the biggest mistakes that I see a lot of makers make, especially when they go to style their product photos, is they just choose some random props or, you know, something they have lying around the house and they don't put <laughs> a lot of intention into it. One of the biggest things that I teach is to be intentional, intentional, intentional about every single thing that we do when it comes to product photography, because it's, communication. Like you are trying yes. to communicate something very specific to a very specific person. So when it comes to a certain vibe now with product photography, we don't want to use filters. We don't want to use, and people may have some questions about presets. I am not an advocate for presets or actions for Photoshop. Um, you want to keep your product as true to real life as possible. And all of these things, they will alter the look of your your photo mm -hmm. so to do that yeah so to do that it's really you really have to focus on the props and the backgrounds you choose because your light has to be the correct temperature you can't you can't create this darker moody light um because it's going to alter the way your product actually looks and the, the true color of your product now you can get a little fun and playful on social that's perfectly fine um especially with dynamic type lighting um, a lot of people think this light, bright, and airy gives off a, a certain, you know, vibe or aesthetic. But really, our options are kind of when it comes to product photography specifically, is that light, bright, and airy look or that more high dynamic, you know, hard shadow type of look, which that's great for marketing images. Not so great for your listing photos where you want them to see exactly what your product looks like. Yeah. And then you get those bad reviews from people who saw it on social and you've, <clears throat> you've added a bunch of filters or enhanced the colors to the point where they're not true to the item. And then you get bad reviews because somebody says, well, why, mm -hmm. why didn't it look the way that it did? Or this wasn't as described. Um, I, one of my favorite social media accounts to follow that, that really expertly has mastered their aesthetics through presets for their marketing is... Oh no, she disappeared. Oh, well... I'll get, to... her, I'll get her another cam back. Okay. Uh, does she need a new link? I will. She okay. can attempt to join by the same link. Okay. Um, let me go ahead. You can keep talking though. Okay. Um, 
bookish box or the bookish box, they use a very warm, almost orange type preset. Um, and it, it just, it has a whole vibe to it. Uh, it. I highly recommend checking them out on Instagram, the bookish box, but I love their use of props. They use a ton of them. Um, let me say, hold on. Just tell her to use same link. Okay. Use same link. And if it doesn't work, I'll send her a new one. Oh, she's back in. Okay. <laughs> there it went. I don't know why it does that. All right. But we're back. Okay. We are back. Um, But yeah, I, I gave them a social media account that they can go follow if they want to see a cool use of them. Um, I heard something about warm, but then I lost you. <laughs> yeah, it was um, book the bookish box. They do okay. these beautiful, very warm, very orange tone, mm -hmm. dark academia style photos for their marketing. Um, it has like a very much old library feel and they oversaturate their photos mm -hmm. with props, but they do yeah. so very skillfully. So for those businesses who really want to just like, you know, cram it up and make um, almost like a visual adventure where your eyes explore the photo for long periods of time. Um, they do a great job of that, but that's, that's really hard to pull off. You have to really have an eye for it because I've also seen, you know, people who go to the Dollar Tree and they buy 10 tons of artificial flowers and it just looks like an absolute like garage sale mess. Mm -hmm. So that brings up a good point because there you can, you can do a lot of things like that and you can incorporate a lot of props and that kind of stuff but that becomes more of you know getting more not necessarily the professional side of it but it's kind of like a stair step like you're going to start at a, a specific point right and you're going to kind of master mastering your light is going to be most important and then you want to learn how to get the most from the smartphone camera that you're that you're using and then we want to really kind of one of the first things that i teach inside of my programs is visual marketing and sales like really truly understanding your own branding and your ideal customer and how you're going to communicate with them like if you don't if you don't have a clear understanding of of your brand and what kind of value you're trying to offer a specific person you're gonna have a really hard time creating visuals that actually attract and sell i mean it's just Point blank and simple. That that's buyer psychology for you. Oh, so um, I mean, niching is important. Having a oh, defined no. target audience is important. What? Never, never. What you guys, you guys, who all think I'm crazy because I tell you to stop cramming your shop with everything under the sun just because you can. Right. It's it's crazy that another coach is now telling you that maybe you shouldn't do that. Well, this is how I always tell you know my my students is if you're it depends on your goal, right? But if your yeah. goal is to grow, grow your sales. Cause I have some people that say, eh, I make sales and my product photos are okay. And I'm like, yeah, but imagine how much more sales you make if your photos are like amazing. Like if you're already making sales and this all depends too on the type of product you sell, um, where you're selling it. Like if you create a very in demand type product, right? Like you're gonna do a little better Mm -hmm. on Etsy because people are searching for it. You're not going to necessarily have to have as great of product photos because people are searching for your product. But if you are selling something that's very unique, like I think what you used to sell, Starla, is you know, pretty unique. You probably had to do a lot more marketing because there probably weren't as many people searching for it on Etsy. And then at that point, you have to have amazing product photos so that you can, you know, really set yourself apart. Um, I kind of lost my train of thought on that, but oh, the whole adding props and stuff. I think a lot of makers come out the door and they just want like this end result, right? Like I've been a photographer for 20 years. I've been a product photographer since 2015. I still am learning. I am learning every single day. Okay. So I think it's important that you start and you continue to increase that process. Maybe you start adding additional photos. You start adding more props and playing. And the cool things about composition is it's design. So if you um, can decorate your home, if you can create graphics, if you can create low, it's all design in the way that our eyes move through an image. So it's really cool. A lot of people don't realize, <laughs> realize that. Like a lot of you have, especially our digital creators out here, you should be able to take amazing product photos because you understand composition. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And 
What are you doing? You're being so mean. <clears throat> getting cough drops because oh. I'm clearing my throat. Oh, okay. Allergies are really bad. <laughs> Same here. I, I keep hearing like crunch, 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 crunch. Yeah, um, sorry, it's it's uh, spring allergy season, yeah, here, I, so I can't. <laughs> um, so we had another really good question. This is one that I hear a lot. Um, we have somebody who lives in um, Washington State, and it just rains all the time. Um, you know. Well, I mean, you can also categorize other. We had quite a few questions of like, I live in a place where it's literally nonstop sunlight, like the conditions that are outside of your control when it comes to lighting. Yeah. So maybe like, let's talk rain and then let's talk sun and maybe that'll cover everybody. OK, so actually on day one of the challenge, we're actually going to break down your home. Like each of you are going to go through the process with me and we're going to go through. I think it's like five steps and we're going to actually map out your house. And we're going to look at where does where is you have the most presence of light. So a lot of people don't realize the sun rises. I mean, they realize this sun rises in the east and sets in the west, right? But they don't realize how that affects their windows or the light available to them inside their home. So if you and this is just a couple couple tips, I think I just got done recording day one. And I think it was eight tips that I had for you for getting when you when you struggle with not having enough light. There was eight cures that I'm going to give you. First thing, if you wake up in the morning and it's pouring rain, location is, is key. So you're going to go to the spot that's going to give you the most potential sunlight, okay? Which that would be, if you're shooting in the morning, that would be an east-facing window. If you're shooting in the afternoon, that would probably be a west-facing window. So that's step number one. Now, if you are still struggling to have enough light because it's storming and it's pouring rain, you want to make sure you wait till prime time, which is about midday. Okay. So the time of day is going to also factor into this, not just the location, but the time of day. And then there are additional steps that you can take to actually increase the perceived brightness. So we can't make more or less sun, right? The sun <laughs> gives us what it gives us, but the sun, the perceived brightness or the light we actually have available to us it's, um, you know, obstacles can alter that. There's things that surface area can alter that. So if you have light coming in through a window, but it's inside of a huge bedroom, that's a big surface area for that light to travel, right? So if you can actually capture that light and kind of block it in around the window, like get as close to the window as possible, kind of trap it in with some reflection, you're going to completely increase that perceived brightness. Now, there are going to be some limitations and sometimes it's going to be a value base where you're like, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that, right? Another option is artificial light. If you work nine to five and you obviously can't shoot product photos at night because it's dark, right? And we have these limitations that we can't control. You only have the option of shooting on Saturdays or Sundays and it doesn't fit into your schedule. Well, that's probably artificial lights, probably the way to go. If you live in a place where it constantly, you know, rains, there are, after you've gone through all of my steps, if you still feel like you're not getting enough light, artificial light might be the opt the way to go. Yep. Sometimes increasing <laughs> it um, or upgrading your camera. Now, I never recommend upgrading unless you have done everything, which you wouldn't know what everything yeah. is unless you worked with a product photographer or worked with a coach. Yep. Unless you've done everything. Because it's DSLR the most cameras, expensive part. It is. It's like the... I mean, prime example, you can buy my course for probably half the price of a DSLR camera, right? <laughs> right and right. you're going to get better results than upgrading and then not knowing how to use it. How much was so, our camera? How much is this? So the camera was close to $3,000, but three adjustable color and brightness LED lights with stands and diffusers was like three hundred and fifty dollars yeah like that that is an astronomical expense your window and, you've already you've already got one of those and diffusion mm -hmm. and reflection cards i think the pack that you shared that's like they're like 65 dollars or something like that right it depends I, on the size yeah. yeah but they come in all different sizes but yeah the prices range from you know 10 to 100 dollars depending on the size you get yeah but yeah i have a artificial light set up in um inside my maker's method course that is less than $150. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, but there's a special quality to natural light, right? Oh, and the cool thing about the, the challenge is I, I teach principles. So while I'm talking about natural light, light is light. So the rules apply, whether mm -hmm. you're using natural, whether mm -hmm. you're using artificial, 
the rules apply whether your product is you know this tiny little ceramic guy or a big throw blanket okay it's just you know looking at a smaller scale versus a larger scale the same rules apply so inside the challenge you're actually you're going to learn the principles of light and you're going to understand how light works whether it's natural or artificial it's just our core focus is going to mm -hmm. be on making natural light work for you because it's free and it's beautiful and it allows you to you know when you once you get past where you're afraid of it it's so fun to actually like play with it and modify it in a way that just you know brings out this creativity it's a lot of fun yeah and guys um that challenge is down below I, we've constantly got people in and out of the stream so if you're interested in that it's only 37 dollars. it kicks off on monday uh sunday is obviously your last day to sign up for it because it kicks off on monday but you can rewatch the videos if, if you're busy um so Feel free to check that out. She's got a ton of information, lots of different examples of lighting scenarios that you're going to be learning about. Um, but one thing that I'm assuming it's not going to cover and, and something that um, someone had just asked that you and I talked about yesterday, they said, can you give pointers on how to have your mock-up pictures for uh, print-on-demand start out? So uh, I, I'm going to assume that if you rely on mock-ups, $37 challenge probably isn't for you. <laughs> um. If you're relying on mock-ups that, so we've had a couple questions in regards to like what the challenge would cover. So yeah. the, challenge, the challenge is covering light. We are going to, but the cool part about the challenge, and I'm so excited about it and I can't wait to, you know how when you create something and people haven't experienced it yet and you're like, you're hoping it plays out in your mind like it will be. But what you're going to get is you're going to get this, this chart essentially where you wake up in the morning and you're going to evaluate the light you have available to you. So that concept of, is it dark? Is it raining, cloudy, or is it bright sunshine? We're going to pick the location based on that. Once you get your setup there in that location, you're going to be able to look at a list of symptoms that you may be experiencing, whether that's harsh light or shadows or reflections. And you're going to get this list of all the different cures for each of those. And we're going to take it day by day. So we're going to, you know, answer your, your big or address your biggest pains each day. But on the last day, we're going to put it all together. And I'm going to show you how you can modify your light within minutes to get the ultimate light for product photography, which is that soft, even light with minimal shadows and you know no reflections. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, so because there, there were quite, there there were a, quite a few questions. questions that actually kind of went along with that. People saying that they, they photograph glass, <clears throat> some people using real light, some people using artificial light and diffusion and all that stuff, and they're still getting they, large glares on their photos. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So again, we're gonna break that down. So if you, if you've done some of the steps to reduce reflection, mm -hmm. there's additional steps you can do. Sometimes, depending on the type of product, depending on the sunlight I have available to me, sometimes I use multiple layers of diffusion. The hard part with that is every time you add an additional layer of diffusion, because yeah. the light is traveling through, even though you know it's transparent, it still absorbs some of it. So we're losing a little bit of that light uh, quantity every time we add a layer of diffusion. So you got to have this like balance of, yes, we want to reduce the intensity. Yes. We want to, you know, fix the reflections, but we also don't want to use so much diffusion that we now have an issue with not having enough light. And that's the kind of stuff we're going to address every single one of these challenges inside the challenge, but mm -hmm. no, yeah. it will not cover mock-ups. Um, was the question, was it there was, a specific question in regards to mock-ups? Yeah, it was, could you give pointers on how to make mock-ups um, for POD stand out more like on a search page? Because in my experience, I mean, everybody just uses the same ones that Printful and Printify give them. And you're not going to really stand out if you're just relying on those base mock-ups. I mean, there are other great places to get your mock-ups. There are Etsy sellers that sell them, um, especially if you're using standard things like Gildan, Bella Canvas, just depending mm -hmm. on what you're printing. Uh, Placeit is another great one that you could be utilizing. It, it does cost money, but I mean, it's, it's a business expense, right? Um, uh, or removing the backgrounds from your mock-ups that you're getting from places like Printify and Printful mm -hmm. and adding in your own unique backgrounds just to change it up. But don't just take those photos that you're getting straight from your POD service, slapping those in your Etsy store and mm -hmm. thinking that that's enough. Because for one, you're not standing out. For two, you're not giving any aesthetic to your brand 
Um, and, and for three, you just look like everybody else who's using the exact same thing. You start to blend. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and Canva has, so Canva has smart mockups and you mentioned place it. The only yes. problem with those two concepts is it's not your product. Yeah. So <laughs> it may be a white coffee mug, but it's not going to be the exact same product. And this will create trust issues. So in general, though, um, original, image are set, uh, Im original images are said to convert seven times better than stock photos, which mock-ups are stock photos, okay? Um, I think there's kind of a misconception there, but because you can put your design on it and make it your own, it's still considered a stock photo. So I had actually asked Starla about this because... You know, I used to be a top Etsy seller. I keep up with Etsy pretty much via Starla and the videos that she puts out. But she's been doing a lot of POD lately. So I had asked her, I'm like, I know it's always been, you know, a, a form of, of selling, but it seems to really be upticking at this point, right? And the biggest concern there is eventually, if people continue to start selling, you know, print on demand, you're going to start seeing a lot more of those same images show up in Etsy search. And at this point in time, maybe you're not, um, you know, you definitely want to be searching your specific market. But when we start seeing these same images over and over and over again, two things are going to happen. People aren't even going to like notice them because it's, it's just that same concept of, you know, we're being flooded with the same information all the time. So they're not going to notice and they're not going to stand out. That's going to put the person who actually takes the time to learn how to take their own product photos or even create their own mock-ups. They're going to stand out like significantly. So if you can invest in this skill and you can learn this skill, that's going to highly set you apart from your competition because a lot of makers aren't willing to do that. They aren't willing to learn a new skill. I get we wear all the hats, right? We do every <laughs> single role in our business and we becoming a product photographer isn't one that they want to do. Um, but it's one that I'm telling you will pay you time and time again when it comes to, um, you know, just all sides of it. So as far as mock-ups, using what Printful or Printify gives you, the best advice that I have for you is if you if you must use them, and I think Starla gives the same advice, you need to adjust them in some way to make them your own. Okay, you can, you know, take what they give you and you can add a different background, you can adjust some of the elements, you can make it your own. But the biggest thing is when you when it's just this generic photo, you blend in with everybody else. There's nothing that sets you apart. And there's no branding involved in it. So people aren't going to recognize you as, as the owner of that product. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean, I did a video. Um, I know that I did a video on how to stand out on Etsy. Mm -hmm. I believe that's where I talk about it, but I show on the page, I had done like a simple shirt, like mama bear shirt mm -hmm. or some, some search. And I counted up how many times the same mock-up was used. And it was just like, bam, 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 all different sellers. And well, that's a fun little uh, test there. Take take that mock-up and go do a reverse image search of it on Google and see how many sellers are using it. Yeah. And that's another thing when, you know, as far as visual search, I don't know if that's going to take off, but that's going to present problems for people that use, you know, mock-ups as well. If people start using that visual search option, um, that can potentially, depending on, you know, Etsy's visual search is a little different. You know, they're always behind. Yeah, it's very basic compared to like, say, Google Lens. But I'm telling you, it's all going to trickle eventually. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we had had an interesting one. This one gets more into the realm of, I, I believe, color correction, because we have a similar issue with videos. They say they use their Samsung phone to photograph colored glass beads and necklaces uh in the natural natural light next to the window their bead color is accurate but the background white card blue gray and cream cards come out beige so i think okay. we're getting more into the realm of color correction with this kind of stuff so one of the easiest options for color correction when it comes to natural light is actually using a diffuser mm -hmm. because the light diffuses through this pure white yes. and so it actually takes away that yellow or that cool cool cast so mm -hmm. the sun in itself is like, I typically don't have color issues when I shoot with natural light because I typically always use diffusion. Mm -hmm. um, so that's just not something that I experience a lot of. So try that, that technique. Um, if you're experiencing 
they said beige though not really like a grayish color yeah they said um, they said beige gray gray to me is usually what i see with our cameras but beige is a little different okay so gray is typically at underexposure mm -hmm. um and sometimes i think people have a hard time telling the difference between like gray and like that slight cool color temperature the blue yep um but gray is going to be an underexposure um when it comes to your actual this is where it gets difficult because if your actual product is showing true to color but your background isn't there really isn't a lot of great solutions except for selective editing at that point yeah um so i mean that's a hard one and it, it also could be your perception that your photos are coming out similar as well if your background is discolored that likely means that everything in your photo is discolored in the same kind of spectrum and also keeping in consideration that not all cameras are 100% color accurate in red, mm -hmm. green, and blue. Some of them are dip, like our camera, for instance, when we record videos, I have to add like five to 10% of a cyan to our, to our videos mm -hmm. in order to make blacks represent as blacks. Otherwise they're grays, whites come out as blue. If I add cyan, completely color corrects the whole thing. And it's just the tiniest little bit. So it could also be your sensor throwing off your colors based on the type of light that it's receiving. It might be oversaturating the red or the blue or something like that, making it not come out correctly. But that's a, that's a really like in-depth color correcting mm -hmm. thing. I think, I think it, starting yeah. with diffusion and lighting is definitely the way to go. Well, red and purple are hard in general. Like cameras yeah. actually have a hard time with those ones. Um, but go into afterwards. I mean, you can do this prior to shooting as well. You can play with your white balance. Mm -hmm. But if you go into edit, editing and just slightly, your setting may be a white balance setting. It may be a temperature setting. But typically blue and yellow is going to be temperature. And then tint is going to kind of be that green and, and pink. And yeah. so you can kind of play with those a little bit to see like Mark said, maybe you think the product's showing true to color, but if you just like, if they're showing beige, then you may want to um, go a little cooler on the temperature, like just a one or two uptick and see if that actually takes it down to kind of pure white and then also bump your exposure up a little bit. Um, Cause once you get to that kind of pure white, it may still kind of look grayish. And then if mm. you increase that exposure, but you know, this is, we don't want to do editing, you know, especially no. selective <laughs> editing, right? Like, like we said in the beginning, fixing in post is a bad habit to get into if you can correct it. If it's your equipment, that's one thing. Sometimes you can't you can't help it, but you definitely don't want to be fixing in post. And also, um, just kind of a, a pro tip, when it comes to editing, it's always a good idea if you have the ability while you're editing, turn off and on whatever effect you're adding back and forth to make sure you're not overdoing it. It's the, the human eye and the human ear are really bad at identifying when you're going a little too far when you start getting into the editing realm and something might look good to you. So if there's like an undo, redo button, definitely utilize that so you can tell whether or not what you're doing is actually doing damage to your edits yeah yeah toggle back and forth and actually one trick of mine that i always use is i bump it up to where i think yeah visually it looks good and then i take it down a couple notches because like you <laughs> yep. said typically it is and then also um depending on what software you're utilizing if you then go and view it on like a pure white that's also super helpful yeah so if I'm editing on my phone, I'll typically, after I save it, I go into the Photos app because on iPhone, like it's the white background in the Photos app. So I don't know why more apps don't utilize the white as the background mm -hmm. to help with that. I don't know why a lot of editing apps don't do that. But that also helps too. Like, so always look at your image on pure white after, and it'll really, it'll really yep. show you whether you're warm, cool, or your colors are accurate yep. or not. And if you're getting into the more, more advanced, like color correction and lighting correction and stuff like that, it's always a good idea as well. When you're messing with settings that maybe you don't understand, just turn them all the way up. See what they're doing. See what they're right. actually doing. I do that in in everything that I edit. I take it way too far, take it way too low the other direction, and see what it's actually manipulating so you can understand, well, okay, well, this makes this particular product look good, but they turn this thing in the background a weird orange color, and I don't want that. You might not notice that unless you take it to those extremes. Yeah, yeah. And can I add to that? Sure. So one little tip that I love to give people, especially when they're they're playing with natural light and they're trying to achieve kind of that even light, most smartphones have an option for you to shoot that exposure all the way up prior to shooting. Mm -hmm. If you do that, so go home and play with this, or I guess you are home. <laughs> um, <laughs> after we get off, play with this. But go set up a photo and shoot that exposure all the way up. What will happen is you will see 
what blows out first. And that's going to be where you have the most presence of light. And it may end up being on one side of the image or the other. But the, the reason this is helpful is because if you do a lot of editing, this uneven light, it's going to present a lot of problems for you in post. Because if you don't have an even light source and you're trying to raise that exposure, well, you're going to end up blowing out part of your product to get the other side in correct exposure. So when you can kind of play with that prior to shooting, it's really helpful to see like, okay, these are the challenges I'm going to be faced with when I go to edit because my, my, you know, light is just so uneven. Yep. All these weird little tips and tricks you pick up just over random yeah. years of, of experimentation. Um, we had a couple people who had talked about, you know, they use diffusers, but they're still, getting reflections of their, um, you know, their poses where they're trying to get their picture or their, their camera, um, or, you know, the room, they're just getting, you know, th those reflections, even while using a diffuser. And it just reminds me if, if anybody's seen that picture of the guy trying to sell a reflective tea kettle and he's taking the picture, but you can see him naked yeah, in the room. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> and he's got it like listed on eBay, um, you know, and, and something that I do when I'm looking at magazines, when I'm looking at billboards, I actually try to catch in sunglasses and glasses and reflective products. Mm. A lot of times you can kind of see a camera or kind of see a photographer. But I think that if you're not looking for those things, as long as it's not ridiculously distracting, I mean, I'm assuming that it's probably not a big deal as long as you don't see like a full human being like if it's not the first thing that my eye catches when i'm looking at the photo because you're getting into kind of pretty intense editing at that point trying right. to remove a reflection and that takes a lot of skill do you i mean do you have any tips to help kind of reduce that aside from diffusers or is it a you know it's really going to depend on your specific product it's really going to depend on um your setup. Can you hear my dogs? I'm so sorry. Oh, no, know. it's totally no, it's, fine. It's, yeah, barely, okay, it's barely wonderful because they are losing their minds over something. They're upstairs, but they're still losing their minds. Okay. Um, a lot of times the easiest option is to adjust your angle. So mm -hmm. either, you know, change the angle of the camera so you're not like directly in front of that. If you have a lot of light behind you, that's going to, you know, create that shadow of you being on there. So kind of adjusting your light as well. Boxing in your setup. Um, a lot of times you can, and, and this is like, I mean, it, it's really what you're willing to do, but a lot of times you can actually fully box it in and just leave like a small hole with your lens. So mm -hmm. if you have very, very highly reflective products, like a, a tea kettle where it's not just a part of your product, it's the entire product. A lot of times encasing that and then just having a small like hole for your lens really, really helps. And when it comes to, so we're dealing with reflection there. And that gets a little tricky too, because light reflects color. So if you have, you know, a white internal softbox, but you're looking at a really dark product or a silver product, well, you're going to get this white cast around the whole, the whole thing. So we got to kind of be mindful when we're using reflection or we're boxing things in that we aren't just bouncing all of that around and reflecting it back on to the product. So sometimes if you have darker products, you might see like a white haze over um, that's reflecting back into. And it's the same thing with like lighter products. If you got anything dark in the area like us. So a couple of other tips, depending on your product color, use what you wear is going to matter. Everything in your settings is going to matter. Um, if you have a white product, then I recommend wearing a white shirt because it's going to help blend that reflection mm -hmm. more than wearing a black shirt, which is going to stand out on that product. Um, so there's a lot of different different tips and, and tricks to use. And this is a big part right here why I offer so much personal one-on-one yeah. -on -one support inside my course because everybody has personal issues, right, with their product. They mm -hmm. have different products, different yeah. lighting, different cameras. And so really getting to like get into your business and see what you're experiencing, like actually see your setup and teach you specifically how to modify or help you modify it. That's why the personalized solutions are so, I feel like I'm being kind of generic in my answering, but it's hard. I mean, it's hard mm -hmm. too. Oh, yeah. There's all kinds of different tips and tricks, but I'd have to like see what you were doing to help you actually like correct it, if that makes sense. Yeah. And and I'm going to go ahead and grab Julie's question. She just asked it, um, but she had asked if the course, and I assume she means the, um, the five-day challenge, mm -hmm. if it's going to cover editing or if it's mostly just, um, you know, natural light. She said that she takes most of her photos in natural light, but she's 
clueless with editing. So I'll, I'll be fully transparent here. I barely edit. I am, um, you have some photographers who they shoot and that's all they do is post. And you know, some photographers who focus on getting like results, you know, naturally and then barely editing. So a lot of my editing is just resizing um, and then, you know, slightly adjusting exposure and uh, color temperature if necessary. I don't do a lot of edits. Um, now for the challenge specifically, because that was your question, uh, on the fifth day, we will be going into the camera a little bit and doing some editing because we're going to be talking about how to get true to color um, on, on Friday. So that's the only editing we're going to be, be talking about. Uh, the challenge is specific to natural light. So uh, that is the only thing that we are going to be covering that week. But in true fashion, I have a couple videos that I added that give some additional tips <laughs> on how to use your smartphone, how to set up your setting, how to style a little bit, different things there. Because I want you guys to have the best success possible as you work through this challenge. And there are certain things you need to know, like step one, clean your lens. <laughs> Good God. Yes, please. <laughs> oh, God. You would not believe how many of those blurry, awful, foggy photos that foggy, I see posted. Foggy, yeah. foggy. Yes. That's it right there. Which is so funny because, you know, I, I have a smartphone challenge that I do and that's day one. It's so simple. Clean your lens. But when they see the before and afters and I have some, you know, students that come in who have never cleaned their lens before. And I can't, I can't even, I can't even imagine what's on it. I mean, you throw it in your pocket, you throw it in your purse. You, I mean, yeah. Clean your lens. <laughs> and your shirt may not always be no. the best thing to do that with. Microfiber cloths oh, cost almost nothing. I'm not going to hold that up in front of the camera, I but little, little cloth uh, patches. Yeah, I like little lens wipes. Yeah, yep, little high class camera lens wipes. <laughs> yep. um, so we are at one o'clock. We normally do these until 1.30. It just depends on how many more questions you want to answer. So it's totally up to you. I'm good. Um, I'm here to hang. Okay, so right, how about cool. this? <laughs> We this have we have a ton of questions from you guys. So what I want to do is maybe for the next 15 minutes, let's blast through as many of your questions. But after that, the last 15 minutes, if you guys have questions about Christina's five day uh, natural light challenge, because you only have till Sunday to sign up for that links down below. A lot of the things that you want to know are probably on the sign up page. But if you have a question about that, maybe in the last 15 minutes, we just kind of focus on those to make sure that this is actually right for you if it's something that you're interested in. And to help us better identify your questions, um, could you maybe put a red heart emoji in your question when you type it out that way we can quickly see it so we know um identification it, yeah yeah let's do it that way um and we'll just cover that last 15 minutes so but for 15 more minutes we will keep trying to answer other questions um okay i think i think this next one's more of a preference kind of thing this person they they sell herbs and they put their herbs in plastic bags <clears throat> and have tried some of the techniques we've talked about. Is it drugs? It sounds like drugs. <laughs> Either way, represent your product in the best Wait, way you can. The <laughs> uh, right? uh, they said, I wonder if I should always take my herbs out of the bags for photos. And I think that's going to be preferential. I mean, obviously taking a picture of a plastic bag, you're, you're, you're risking reflections and, and whatnot, but I, I guess it's more product placement with that kind of thing. Well, so this goes back into each image being specific and intentional, right? So if you package your product that way, and that's how they're going to receive it, then yes, you should have at least one photo that shows them how they're going to receive the product. And when it comes to packaging, especially like if you use clear, um, like one of these, these little guys here, like reflection's fine. It's, I mean, it's showing and reflection isn't always bad, especially if it's showing that the product is reflective, it's really those like, you know, big, like us or the naked guy in, in the image. We don't <laughs> want to see that stuff, right? Like we don't want there to be like these huge distracting things. So you want to at least have one that's going to show how they're going to receive the product. But I always recommend to my students, if they sell something that comes in a sleeve like that, like I have some students that sell cookies, they sell, um, you know, gift cards, different things like that. Make sure you photograph just the product as well. All right. Um, this one, this one's a little harder. Um, Lenny asked, I have items that have lamination over them. They're bookmarks with laminated coverings. 
I use a light box to take my pictures. Would you suggest not using the lighting uh, or the light box and taking the photos outside? So this goes back to that concept of you're using a light box. The entire inside of it is white reflective. So all of that white is going to reflect back onto your product and your product's reflective. So that's kind of what you're going to see. I'm assuming she's probably getting some kind of white film over the bookmark and you can't really see the design. That's because you're in a light box and you've got all this, this white reflection. Now you can um, try to potentially add um, like some black foam core boards inside of the box um, to kind of absorb some of the light and have that darker reflect back. It kind of depends on whether your product's dark or light too, like your design, your actual bookmark design. If it's a darker bookmark, this may be helpful. Um, but natural light would probably be a better option in that scenario because you're going to have limitations with reflective products inside of a soft box that has a smaller surface area. Now, the other solution, I don't personally recommend store-bought light boxes because they typically have a really tiny like LED strip yep. um, or two LED strips and small light sources create hard to find shadows. And with, with light boxes, that kind of balances out a tiny bit because you have so much reflection. But I actually encourage my students to build their own. So I actually have a DIY option inside of my course, and it's actually mm -hmm. really big. It has a really large surface area. And this is actually helpful when you're photographing reflective products because you're not getting that direct light onto the product that's not as intense. So two solutions, reducing intensity by increasing your surface area or adding in some kind of black, you know, absorption um, or try natural light for sure. Yeah. Experiment, experiment, play with it. You know, you, you are, you are your best judge. So test them both out. Um, we had quite a few questions about props. thoughts, thoughts on props. Should you use them in your product Maybe photos? Maybe how to tastefully use them. Social media or only for social media. How do you use props that aren't <laughs> taking attention away from the actual product? Um, all the questions about props. Okay, so that's almost like how to take good product photos. <laughs> um, okay, so yeah. first question. Yes, I would always recommend at least having one type of... So here's how I separate them. I talk about styled images and I talk about lifestyle images. So when I when you hear me say those things, styled is props. Lifestyle is actual human. So you're showing the product in use on, on an actual person. Um, sometimes your product can be both. So we can style jewelry with some relevant props, like maybe the jewelry is on a nightstand in a little tray. There's some actual relevant props in there, but we can also do a lifestyle image of it on a model and someone, uh, you know, wearing it. So for that specific one, I would include both of those inside of a listing. Again, what are we trying to communicate? So we're intentionally choosing photos that are going to answer questions, that are going to show the value of your product, that are going to, you know, meet objections, anything that the customer may want to know, because especially on Etsy, they're not getting to that description, right? So definitely recommend at least having one in your listing. Next, you said you were asking about the composition in general. A couple, couple quick tricks I'll give you guys. Portrait mode. If you have a smartphone that does portrait mode, that has a blur option, anything like that, set your, your props back at least a good six, seven inches from your product and blur them out. Uh, if you want to utilize props, having them just peek into the image frame. So these are different ways to keep focus. Okay. So these are tips and tricks to keep focus when you're using props. Peaking is a good one. Blurring the background is a good one. You want to keep your props pretty neutral. Um, red and yellow are very attention grabbing. So I recommend unless we're, you know, doing a little more advanced where we're working on a very specific message, just don't use red and yellow props ever because they will take focus away from, from your product. Um, let's see here. The peaking, uh, framing is a good one. Framing is a good one that adds focus. Like if you can, you do any kind of contrast, so color contrast, shape contrast, anything like that is going to make your product pop and stand out. So there's, there's a lot, a lot of different things you can do. Yeah. Experiment and look at other people who are in your industry and see what they're doing. How are they utilizing their props on social media? Do a deep dive and they don't have to be 
Etsy sellers. If you make silver jewelry, start looking at premium silver jewelry businesses. Um, mm -hmm. Are they cluttering up their product photos with weird mm -hmm. flowers and, and things? Or are they using, you know, little geometric shape, abstract, you know, little sculptures and things? I, I mean, it, it really, again, boils down to your niche and what is going to create the aesthetic and the vibe that your brand is all about in in terms of selecting um props and then it's just you know getting good at actually staging them in a way that like christina said they're framing more than just being front and center yeah the goal is always for your product to be the focal point it is the subject of an image but to starla's point researching big brands because it's actually interesting we're starting to see this trend of big brands moving away from that that studio shot on pure white yeah and initially that happened because of for ai image you know image recognition purposes well ai is getting smarter and so they can image recognition is also getting you know smarter in that capacity and big brands are starting to play with more lifestyle type images because they don't need them for seo purposes um there was something else I was going to add in regards to, to your comment, but, you know, checking your competition, just, yeah, I lost it. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it'll it'll okay. come back. <clears throat> this is a good one. Yeah. What would you suggest for product photos on dark backgrounds as far as limiting the apparent background color changes in a situation where you can't go outside, but there are, but you are by a few windows? Yeah, we get a lot of people who say, like, I want dark backgrounds. And I see people who do a good job with darker backgrounds. Um, but I have also noticed that they are usually already skilled photographers. Yeah, yeah. and dark background, anything dark around your photo is going to absorb some of the light from the photo. So it yeah. does kind of increase the challenge a little bit. Yeah, so two different things here. Um, this is more dynamic type lighting. Um, because if you have that direct sunlight coming in and hitting like a black background, it's going to mute it. Right. Um, you, this is a uh, flagging. So it's called, it's another, we didn't talk about it. Um, as far as like the, the challenge goes, cause we're not going to be doing dynamic lighting in the natural light challenge, but it is a type of modifier. It's called flagging. And what that essentially does is it blocks the light. So a lot of times I'll do a setup. Like let's say the background is like a black looking kind of slate. I will block the light on, you know, from the light source coming in, let's say like halfway through my setup. So the back half is going to be blocked on the left side, which is going to block the light from hitting the backdrop. And that's going to just create this nice light that actually hits the product. And then the background's kind of shadowed. Okay. Another option is a lot of times when we have darker backgrounds and we go into editing to bump that exposure up, use a curves tool and now the curves tool may seem super super intimidating and um one of my favorite and again i'm surprised people haven't asked about software um but <laughs> one of my favorite on if you like to edit on your phone is snapseed it's free but it has a ton of pro tools and what you do is you go in and on the actual curves tool it allows you to increase the highlights but then you can bring those darks back down if you are using an editing software that doesn't have a curves option look for an option where you can take the, the darks back down or the blacks back down. Um, because when you increase that exposure, again, it's going to kind of just wash out those darks. So you just need to take the darks back down. What was the name of that? Can we uh, maybe type it in the chat, Mr. Moore, so they can yeah. look it up? Snap cut. Actually, it's actually Snap. from Google. Google owns it. It's Snapseed, S-N-A-P-S-E-E-D. There, we'll, we'll type it in the chat for you guys so you, you can go. check it out. Um, <laughs> but then it's, mo it's mobile well it's mo i say mobile only because you can use it on a, a desktop or a mac with an android emulator but it doesn't function the best so yeah. that's a great yeah. mobile option um we did have somebody ask how much for an hour of your time one-on-one -on -one? <laughs> uh, i actually charge 97 dollars for that but uh, with my Maker's Method signature course, you actually get 10 one-on-one -on -one 60 minute calls with me. When is, uh, when does that, uh, because you're doing your challenge mm -hmm. um, this upcoming week, which that is the five day challenge that we keep talking about. That's linked down below. But after that, you're going to be opening your actual big full course where they can yeah. get one-on-one. -on -one. When does that open? Uh, my signature course, the Maker's Method will open on Friday, April 28th. And if you do participate in the challenge you pay the 37 dollars for that and you decide you want to work with me inside of the maker's method 
that will be applied to the course price. Oh, cool. I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't know that. That's yeah. awesome. Super cool. Okay. So that might be something that you guys want to look at when that opens. Um, and I assume that if they follow you on like social media, uh, by Christina Nicole on all of her channel, and she, you can go to her YouTube channel that's linked down below and that'll also zip you, you know, you'll be able to find her social medias by following her there. Um, I'm most active on YouTube. I am, you know, I have not gotten to the point in my business where I can keep up with the constant content yeah. on all platforms. It's a lot. So I hang out the most on YouTube. But, but when you open that course, I'm assuming you'll probably announce it somewhere yeah. on YouTube. Okay, so just go to her channel. It's linked down below. Subscribe, click the bell icon. Then when she uploads a video, you know, talking about it, you'll get a notification. Just just be aware that it will be in a little, a little over a week, right? A little over yep. a week. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so just keep an eye out if that's something that you did want to do. So, so for you guys posting the heart react questions, those are supposed to be specifically about her course, not other questions similar to these. Yeah. So I'll be skipping those ones. Um, if you guys have questions specifically about her course, uh, post the hearts before the question and we'll get to those here in the next couple of minutes. We did get one. There was <clears> one person who, um, who said is the core interactive? or is the course interactive mm. or recorded? Yeah, we haven't gotten to that yet. I had a couple other questions. Oh, okay. That to... that, that's okay. That's okay. Well, we can we can go ahead and answer that yeah, one. Yeah, we can go ahead and answer that one. You want me to answer that one? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah okay. So the, the challenge, the five-day challenge is coming up, the five-day natural light challenge. That is um, the lessons actually are pre-recorded. And I mainly am pre-recording them because I don't have control over the light, right? And I want to be able to show you guys <laughs> how to fix specific scenarios and I can't control those scenarios in a live setting. So that part is pre-recorded. You'll get a daily, daily lesson, um, 6 a.m. to your inbox, and you will be able to watch that lesson. And then we do have live critiques and Q&As every day at 12 noon Eastern time. Cool, cool. So awesome. there, there is an interactive hangout part mm -hmm. of it, but then they can watch their videos anytime. Awesome. Okay. okay. So we had, there There were a couple questions and I think these are probably going to just be me mostly addressing them. We had people asking like, oh, I want to get this phone. Is it good? I want to use this phone. Uh, she uses, and you said at the beginning, you're, you, you like iPhones. You guys know I don't like, I don't like Apple as a company. However, <laughs> however, I will say when it comes to buying a cell phone for photography or videography, if you get any company's flagship phones, we're talking the iPhone, Google Pixel, not one of the $200 submodels, uh, LG, whatever their version is, the Samsung S20, I think they're up to S23 for this generation. Yeah. Any of their flagship phones, usually the phones in the like 599 to 1299 range, mm -hmm. guarantee those cameras are gonna be great. However, for usability, as much as I don't like Apple, while their cameras are great, their software is probably the best on the market as far as like just taking a picture and not having to do much with it. Their color is great. Their dark light performance is probably the best in the industry. That's that's unarguable. If you're buying one of the like $200 cell phones, usually one of the first things to go is the camera goes to a lower quality because it's one of the most expensive pieces of the phone. Mm -hmm. um, however, that being said, most of them are still going to be in the probably 8 to 12 megapixel range, which is almost the same as what most DSLRs are, which are at the what, 16 to 24 megapixel range. Yeah. So pretty much any phone made in the last five to 10 years is probably going to be good to take pictures with. So if it's within your budget, go with what's ever within your budget, to be honest with you. Uh, the next ones were about videos, listing videos on Etsy. And people were asking about, what is it better to shoot at 1080p 60 or 4K 30, this kind of thing. Etsy recommends 1080p 30. However, there's a couple little science things when it comes to this. So when it comes to the FPS, the videos on Etsy, I guarantee are either 30 or 15 FPS. However, they're compressed down. So if you record at 60 FPS, that's only gonna matter if you're doing something where you're moving a lot. If you're moving a lot, if you're recording at 30 FPS versus 60 FPS, if you slow it down, you can see the chopping between. It's a little bit less smooth. Um, what really matters when it comes to the FPS is whether or not it is a multiplicative of 15 or 30. If you're recording at 100 FPS, you're probably gonna get chopping in your video. You want it to be a multiple of 30 or 15 when it comes to that. When it comes to the resolution, it doesn't necessarily matter as long as you're reaching the minimum. So you want to be recording at 1080p because the majority of the sensors are, if they're capable of recording at 4K, it's still a 4K sensor recording a 1080p video. So 
I don't know how Etsy's compression works. So recording a 4K video and uploading it to a 1080p platform, depending on their form of compression, might actually make the video look worse than 1080p. Um, so experiment, see what works for you. But it's not necessary to go over 30 FPS, especially since a lot of the times it will crop in and you'll have to get further or closer to the thing in order to record that 60 FPS. So again, experiment, but meet 1080p 30 as the minimum. They recommend 1080p 15 or 30, but that's the bare minimum. Anyway, sorry, to, I got to do the nerd stuff. That's okay. I love the nerd stuff. And real quick, so I'm I'm iPhone user just because I am an... I like the the software. <laughs> they're, it's, they're great. Like, their, their stuff yeah, is great. I, I switched to Android and I was like, oh my God, I cannot do the interface. Oh no, um, the, the <laughs> software is terrible on Android. But one thing I wanted to mention quick with the smartphones is I think there's this misconception that the more pixels it has, the better better the camera is. And that's not, and that's the, not case. the case. Bigger pixels are actually better. So yes. when it comes to smartphones, they have really small sensors. So there's a reason that Apple has gosh been with a uh, 12 megapixel for i can't even what was it the six or the seven i can't remember it's been a long time, been a long time. I, I think they went down to 10 for one generation and then back up to 12 and i but think I their baselines are eight. Did that like samsung jumped up at one point in time and yep. they went back down as well yep. so 12 megapixels is excellent yes. for for smartphones um and then you know you know mark had mentioned also uploading that real high resolution video can compress and create horrible quality. It's the same with images. So make yes. sure you are resizing because I get a lot of questions about why, you know, some people take DSLR images with their camera or with their camera and then they upload them to Etsy and the quality is horrible. <laughs> um, I just wanted to point out, we'll go ahead and get into questions related to uh, Christina's five day challenge because you guys only have till Sunday to sign up for that. It's only $37. The link to that's down below. Um, full transparency, I've had a lot of people be like, you're only recommending it because you're getting paid. I'm actually not, <laughs> but I am, but I am, um, I am heavily marketing it and I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be taking it with you guys because it's something that I know that I need. We had so many, where were those comments that I, that I had highlighted? You didn't highlight any. Oh yes, I did. Where are they going? And I'll tell you guys too, real quick while she's looking for that. Okay. If you come and you actually participate in the challenge and you feel like it's, you know, wasn't I'm worth it. Die. Let me know. Like, I, I don't, I'll refund you. Like I'm telling you, it's day one. Actually, I'm sorry. Not even day one. The welcome module alone is well worth the $37. And that's taking place on Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. And that for that price, I mean, come on, this is, this is going to be. If so I don't cool. blow your mind, then just let me know. I'm happy to refund you. <laughs> yeah. We had somebody say just FYI to everyone here. I've taken Christina's full course and it was excellent. Uh, light is challenging to learn and use correctly. And she explains and demonstrates what to do so well. And then another person said, Christina is the best in photography coaching. She also has a, a full product photography course that is fantastic. I've learned so much from her. Uh, she's so accessible for help with troubleshooting. That is absolutely awesome, guys. Um, I'm, you're going to make, you're going to make her blush. Um, let's I love see. Dude, it's the best. <laughs> You probably uh, know the best ones advocate for you. <laughs> you, you. There were questions up there. They, I'm looking for the ones that are related to, um, do you cover how to get, um, good flat lays? Yeah, got this. I mean, if you're talking about styling flat lays, no, we're not doing any type of styling. You're not going to learn. I mean, like I mentioned, there will be tips here and there that are going to help you see better results, but this is a light challenge. So we are going to learn how to make natural light work for you, which is going to be the best part. But disclaimer, you will not walk away from this challenge taking stunning product photos as a whole. You're going to walk away from this challenge with less frustration when it comes to trying to light your product photos. And you're going to walk away from this challenge with the solution, no matter what you know, symptoms you're experiencing and challenges you're facing with your natural light. Yeah. And if you guys need like the additional help with things like the styling and, um, you know, some of the other things that Christina talked about today, that would be a point when you might want to consider her larger course that's opening in a, a little over a week, um, because that's more where she's going to go more in yeah, depth. Light, with things. light is one piece of the puzzle. The maker's method, my signature course that covers we did that one. everything. <laughs> You will never need another product photography course again. Awesome. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> um, uh, would your course still be useful to someone that has artificial lights and a DSLR setup? 
I guess it depends if you're struggling with your current light setup. So <laughs> I would assume. Then, yeah. The um, you know, the same rules apply, as I mentioned. You will be learning the principles of light. And I will be, you know, talking here and there about certain things as they apply to artificial light um, or larger products. Um, you know, you're le you're learning light in general. Where focus is our natural light. That's what my examples are going to come from. But light is light. So again, principles. I'm all about principles. Awesome. Uh, how long do we have access to the materials in the course? Okay. So you have 30 days to download all the content, essentially. So if you choose to download the content, then you have lifetime access to all of the lessons and all of the live live events that'll take place throughout the week. Yeah. And that's for the challenge you guys are using. Yeah. We're, we, we keep t we're talking about like the course yeah, that's sorry. opening later and then the challenge. The challenge, you'll it's it's a five day challenge, but you can go in and download them and you can keep them. They they can belong to you. Um, but her course, I assume that's lifetime access. Yeah, the course know. is lifetime access <laughs> and you get um lifetime support in the group, and then you get 10 one on one 60 minute calls with me as well. Awesome. Somebody awesome. asked me to put those numbers in writing. Maybe in the future we can do a video on video recording. <laughs> videography that's yeah, a whole I, different I have thing a point when you're talking about all the, the it's, frames it's, per second i was just like my head was bobbing it, it's a lot <laughs> yeah videos a video is a lot um yeah. gloria had said is the course uh like photography for dummies for all of us folks who have no idea of pixels and all that stuff that you're talking about <laughs> So one thing that I like to do is I do like to talk in photography terms because I like there to be an understanding, but my day to day, um, you know, words, I use basic terminology. So in this specific challenge, I do have one video in the welcome module that's going to take you through a lot of terms and I'm going to tell you what they are in photography terms, but then I'm also going to say, but this is how I will reference it throughout the challenge. And you're actually going to get this really cool handbook and it's going to have all the terms laid out for you. So you can easily, you know, flip back through and look at them. Um, and then my teachings in general do go down to a very, very basic, I talk about infancy level all the time. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, we did have somebody ask for your actual larger course that'll be open later on um how much that course costs uh the one-time payment on that is 797 and i also have um three months six month and 12 month payment plans for that your payment plans are way more flexible than ours. <laughs> i'm strict awesome. I'm, I'm testing it That's... at this point because we shouldn't give them too many options right but we'll see. <laughs> don't abuse <laughs> it guys she'll stop yeah, offering don't, don't it don't abuse it yeah because her course her course is is way more affordable um, than Handmade Alpha Academy, which, you know, my course for for Etsy sellers, that's A to Z, that'll be opening in June. But we did have somebody ask, is the Maker's Method course the one that uh, the Alphas got with our HAA course? No, you guys got the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Product Photography Essentials Workshop. Um, and future Alphas, if you guys decide to enroll in Handmade Alpha Academy in June, you guys get her product photography essentials workshop as well. Um, but that is a separate workshop. So if you're in handmade alpha Academy right now and you enjoyed, um, her, her program, this might be something else that, you know, if you're looking for a new course to take, um, this would be the next level. Um, and, and then we yeah, had some joining, joining the alphas and starting with the product photography essential workshop. It's a great, it's a great workshop. It's like a 14, 14 days where I answer like your most burning questions. Um, it does not come with support though. So the yeah. big difference with that one and the maker's method is you get direct access to me where I can look at your setup. I can help you modify different things. I can answer your specific questions. And the maker's method is built out to actually help you build your personalized product photography workflow. Cool, cool. And then Julie had said, will the recording be available in the future to go back on when needed? Um, are you meaning with the course or what? We kind of covered that with the yeah, for the, yeah. for the challenge. It's lifetime access if you choose to download it. Yeah, okay. you can go in and download those videos and keep them um, for her course. If you're enrolled in that when that opens um, in a little over a week, that it's that one's lifetime access. You can pop in and log in at any time. Uh, Delia had asked. Oh, we already answered that one. Oh, is it the one we got in the HA course? Yeah. Yeah. How often is your main course intake offered? Uh, every six months. So every I do maker's April, method. April and October. 
Cool. That that lines up perfectly because we do mm-hmm. uh, Brigham and Alpha Academy. We do June and December. So there's Sounds like, like uh oh collabs. Uh oh collabs. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. Um, that's that's the last one that we had had. And we're down to the last five minutes. So um, real quick, guys, thanks so much for hanging out. Make sure that you go check out Christina's YouTube channel. It's linked down below. Make sure that you just, you know, if you have more questions or if you're watching the replay and you want to learn more about her five-day challenge, there is a link down below that has a ton of details about that challenge um, and, and what's included and some examples of different photos and lighting scenario so you can kind of see some of the things that you'll be learning um christina is there anything that you want to leave them off with uh or if you know for those who are watching the replay and they're thinking about you know joining the challenge any any other little this is your marketing platform market do well it. honestly at this point here's the thing is i i understand at this point you guys have you know you've taken it to youtube you've taken it to google pinterest you have tried all the things right and you know, how is this going to be different for you? So two things. I have been a photographer for 20 years, but I was a portrait photographer. When I started my product-based business in 2015, I had to learn a lot about transitioning into product photography. So my teaching is geared specifically, not only to e-commerce shops, but to non-photographers. So I really break it down and simplify it for you. And I take it to your level. So you may not be ready to invest in backdrops or ready to invest in additional props or different things. So I kind of meet you where you are and I provide solutions and help you continue to grow because you're not going to be able to do it all, you know, and and I want to set a realistic expectation here. I have students that come in and they do the live support with me and they are you know, actively participating month after month. And it takes them months to kind of revamp their shop. This is not an overnight kind of fix, but with the right information and the right support, you can get results from your smartphone. You can take your own product photos. And there's such a relief when you can get this confidence and be able to do that because you are always going to need photos. You need photos for social. You are going to be creating new products. And I'll tell you right now, my course, have you guys ever seen Suna ads for Suna on um, Facebook or anything? So Suna does product photography. They're specifically marketing Etsy shops. One product. They charge almost the price of my course for one product. Oh, wow. That's that right crazy. There. Yeah. Yeah. It, this is very much, more. <laughs> yeah. This is very much a give a man a fish versus mm-hmm. teach a man to fish. Um, Number and, one and- skill that will pay you time and time again. Yeah, yeah, really. And, you know, guys, product photography, you guys know that I'm the SEO person. I I, I work for E-Rank. Mark works for E-Rank. We talk about SEO, but it does not matter if you are at the very top of a search page, you have mastered SEO. That's great. I'm, I'm so glad that you've done that. However, if your photo looks like absolute poop, nobody's going to click on it no matter what. They're just going to scroll past it. You can mm-hmm. have phenomenal, beautiful, you know, amazing products. But if your photos don't represent those, you are not going to make the sales. And we have a lot of people who say, you know, my SEO is good and I've worked so hard. Why am I not making sales? It's your photos. It is your photos. It is 100% your photos. Um, so consider checking it out. Uh, Christina, thanks so much for hanging out with us today. This was so much fun. I'm so glad that we got to have a guest. Um, and if if they have questions for you or maybe they're on the replay and they want to ask you a question about either the five-day challenge or they want to ask you a question about um, your larger program that's opening in you know a little over a week where can they find you where's a good place to get a hold of you are they going to be able to still leave com like they can leave it won't be a chat but they can still leave comments just like a regular youtube video after right so yeah, you guys, I'll, I'll hang out and keep an eye on this video. You can cool. drop your questions in there and I'll come answer them. You could also shoot me a DM or you can email me at uh, support at by Christina with a K, Nicole.com. Awesome. Awesome. And obviously, if you're watching this like six years from the upload date, um, don't expect I'll her to... I'll hang out for a couple more days. <laughs> yeah. Don't expect her to respond, but maybe like... T- for the length of time that her programs are open, she'll yeah. be able to, she can't just come in every day and look. Yeah. But um, guys, yeah. thanks so much for hanging out. Thanks for all the love in the chat to Christina. Everybody is just going awesome. on. The people that say that they've taken your your course, oh, they love thank it. Thank you guys. Changed I love their life. 
That's amazing. Um, yeah. Oh, Starla, we need a Bubbers update. We forgot. Bubbers yeah. was rushed. Bubbers to was rushed to the hospital. He had what we thought was a blockage, and uh, we confirmed as of yesterday. Uh, he's pooping now, so, so no blockage. He's, he's healthy. He's alive. He's doing good. That was the best two thousand dollar stomach ache he's ever had. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, very expensive that visit, but he's good. So, all right, guys, thanks so much for watching, and uh, we will see you next week. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for Bye. having I'm gonna, me. I'm going to make her Bye. sit here while we. Yeah, we got to uh, wave uh, because it takes a really long time for the video to stop recording. My laziness makes everything.